Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We're so thankful that you've made the decision to join us today for our study. It means a lot to us that you are interested in spiritual matters, in studying the Word of God, in growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if you're watching this at a later point in time, well, we, we are thankful to you as well. If you hear something or see something that maybe sparks a question, understand we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us at questions at truthfactorlive.com, drop us an email, or you can email us individually, as you see on the screen there, john at, brendan at, et cetera, truthfactor.com, and we'll uh, receive your emails and we'll do our best to reply to your question, maybe even bring it into our study. Let's bring everyone in this morning. We are missing Bob and Paul, but other than that, hey, the best of the lot's here. So, <laughs> gentlemen, y'all doing all right today? All right. Just look at me. I couldn't be any better. You, yeah, you could, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, you could look younger, like all of us, except huh? Brendan. If you look younger, except he'd Brendan. be like 12 years old, you know. Yeah. Um, and it needs a big, thick beard. That's yeah, we would crazy. despise his youth. Yes, <laughs> I already do. I I tried the beard one time and it just it, it did not work. Um, <laughs> problem is, my dad said this part will not come in until I hit probably my forties. So. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, that's okay. Facial hair, no facial hair. At least we're not during the time of David where if you had half your beard shaved, you'd have to go and find some place to hide out till it grew back. So. And let's see, we've had several with us today. Gregor has chimed in. Um, Jimmy as well. David Clark is here with us too. And uh, maybe this is your first time joining us. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to use the the uh, comment section connected with our live stream on Facebook or the chat area with our live stream on YouTube, just say hi. I'm Bob from Minnesota or wherever you're from, whatever your name is. We'd love to hear from you. If you're watching through the website, which is truthfactor.com on the live broadcast page, there is a form beneath the live stream where you can also submit a comment that way. Um, it would come in through our email. And so if you'd like to do that, that would be perfectly fine too. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right in. We are picking up in the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 8, verse 12 this morning. So let's go ahead and start there. And then we've got some things we want to talk about before we really get into the heart of this discussion here. So, Tom, if you would, let's start reading in verse 12, and let's go ahead and read through verse 20, if you would, sir. All right, uh, John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20, and again, I'm reading from the New King James. Uh, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have also known my father. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. All right, thank you, Mr. Tom. So verse 12 seems doesn't really seem to stand alone, but it, it kind of sets the discussion for the next part of this. He says to them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Does that sound like um, they're perceiving it as a testimony of Jesus where he testifies of himself? Could that be the launching 
the statement that he makes to launch the following conversation? I believe the answer to that is yes. Uh, I, I think, I think he, you know, when we look at his all, when we look at the audience that Jesus is interacting and we, we always have to remember that in almost every case, with the exception of small gatherings, his audience is mixed. And, and what I mean by that is it's a mixture of followers, those who are genuinely interested in following him. You've got those who are curious about him. And then you've got the critics. You've got the religious leaders who are looking for fault. And, and I think a lot of times, Jesus, and I think this is an example of it. I think this is an example. I think he's directing it to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, um, even though everybody else is there uh, that's going to learn from it. And by the way, by the way the religious leaders act, Jesus exposes them. I think it's a good point. That's a good point. So any thoughts or comments about verse 12 itself when he says, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. It's one of our seven I am statements that uh, okay. we pull out of the book of John. Um, so it, it does have that relevance. Being the light of the world is a big deal in the book mm -hmm. of John. I mean, Jesus, that's the very first thing he tells us about Jesus after telling us he's God in chapter one, uh, yeah. that he was the light, you know. In him, there was no darkness. John loves the light and darkness, uh, it, it, both here in the book of First John. Um, he likes to contrast walking in the light is, is the definition of being faithful, and that's where fellowship lies. So it is, um, it's, a, it's a big deal, but I think, you know, it's, it, what do I say about it? Uh, it is a big deal, but I think probably most people can see why it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, when, when you look at scriptures, there's a lot of different ways that we're described as examples. There's a lot of different descriptions of who Jesus is, where he compares himself to various elements of life. Light is one of the more prevalent. You know, I, I mean, it's it's the default that almost everybody goes to because it's you know, like Brian said, chapter one. I mean, it's really the first thing that he, after calling him the Word, uh, he's the light. And, and uh, that light is just emphasized all over. And by the way, the, the significance of that doesn't just go to the fact that Jesus is the light. It also goes to the fact that we are the light. You know, we, yeah. we are the light of the world. And the light that we are to reflect is his light. So it's a very, very powerful statement. And, and, uh, I, and I think the religious leaders, the Jews, I think they got that. I mean, think about how far into the law of Moses you have to go before you start talking about light. Like what, uh, two verses? Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. All right, Brandon? Uh, well, a couple, couple thoughts here. So... Um, it, do, it does seem that in, in John's gospel that this this little section here, 12 through uh, the 20 or so, continues the same uh, discourse or bearing of witness that Jesus started in John chapter 5 in which he gave the four witnesses. Um, again, kind of showing or fulfilling the Old Testament criterion of by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact will be confirmed or denied. Um some other interesting things here, the whole light of salvation or I am the light of the world. You see this several times uh, in the Old Testament. Um, you know, Leviticus talks about um, the the importance of the lamps burned in the tabernacle as a guide, more or less. Uh, Isaiah talks about the people who are walking in darkness have seen a great light, the, again, promise of the Messiah. So he's not just pulling this out of thin air he's 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 pulling on old testament promises that were pointing to that the messiah would be a guide to the blind in darkness and so this adds to jesus own testimony that it, really this is the fifth witness if you want to think of it that way in addition to the four that were in chapter five and that's why i think you see the pharisees as how she's react the way they do is well you're you're testifying against uh, Olin yourself, and which is funny because they just had this conversation a couple chapters ago, which he says, I'm not only testifying about myself. God the Father, the Spirit, and the Word testify about me. And the miracles and him as a guide showing the way of truth should be another witness to that. 
Um, so those are my few thoughts there. Okay. All right. Well, let's get. We're going to get to that point here in just a second about the witnesses. I think that's a very, very good uh, point. Is it possible? Let me get rid of Brendan's lower third there. Uh, is it possible? I guess possibility. I'm going to use the term inspiration in a little bit different sense. And Tom, you've already, you already you already busted busted my bu bubble with this when you you started it. But it's interesting when you look at John when he wrote his gospel, go all the way back to chapter one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How many times have we read Genesis one, when God made light and separated that light from darkness, and see within that a precursor, maybe a type, anti-type, of what would later come with Jesus Christ and the darkness of the world. Um, when he says, I am light, or as the text here says specifically, I am the light of the world. And y'all have already mentioned this, the number of times that he says that he is the light and we are to walk as children of light. From the very start of the scriptures, there is establishment of light. And I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I'm just saying that it's interesting to note that the first thing that God created was light. And that clearly was separated from the darkness. And it's the light that we walk through, walk in during the day. Um, okay, any thoughts? Uh, to that point, John, um, having recently studied Revelation and other stuff, it's, I, I've become more and more convinced that if we start thinking that there's possibly a ta type, anti-type, or allusion to some sort of biblical imagery, more often than not, it probably is. Uh, yeah. yeah. God... It, it, like any good composer, like any good artist, uh, he's hearkening back to previous things in order to kind of show cohesion in the whole yeah. work. And, Inspired by Genesis one to follow this, yeah. Right. I mean, you. I mean, uh, Paul in Galatians talks about how the gospel has been preached ahead of time through Abraham, and yeah. then he cites the, the the seed promise, and you're like, now. Us, I, who tend to be more linear, I, I read that the first time I'm thinking, well, I don't see that as the gospel. Well, that challenged me to expand my definition, what is the gospel? Uh, and so this this yeah. light motif, it isn't just big in John, it's big throughout the whole Bible. Uh, yeah. This contrast of light and dark, which again shows that Jesus is identifying himself with the creator light, being the light, being everything that God has said light is, he's saying I am. Exactly. Yeah, I think and, you're right. And by the way, we understand that uh, if you've ever watched a good suspense movie or read a suspense book, you know, you start off, where's this going? <laughs> but at the end, it comes together. And, and that, that, writer, he, that writer had to have that in mind when he was starting that work. You know, I mean, and um, the same thing with God, you know, and, and like you said, the, the premise of light all the way through Scripture is just one example of it okay all right let's bring in a comment real quick uh from jimmy he writes light is transparent and so is christ that is why i think he uses this because he wants us to be transparent as christians okay I hadn't thought about it from that standpoint but i think that could be something to really give thought to you know the light reveals there is um, a transparency to the light there in our lives as Christians, we are supposed to be manifested within this world. Yeah, good point. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next section here. I say next section in our discussion here. So the Pharisees, they hear this and they say to Jesus, we read a while ago, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Now, Brendan, you already kind of introduced this a little bit earlier. We see this going back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. So give me just a second. Let me bring this back, bring it up here real quick. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, Jesus in his conversation. You mean there, John 5, 31. You know what? I like Matthew 5, 31, but it won't fit what we're talking about. So we'll do this one. I've got John, I've got John up on the text there. The rule of thumb, when I during any of my lessons, I tell the members, always follow the charts you know more than likely i will state it wrong the odds of that's greater than the chart being wrong although that i've done that before too sorry <laughs> john so here 
Jesus says in the text, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Then he introduces another who bears witness. That's John. Brendan, you actually mentioned four different witnesses in this particular chapter um, earlier, didn't you? We, we have John, we have the works that Jesus did, and therefore God himself. Is there did a fourth say, witness? Huh? Did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying, uh, so here we go. So you have the witness of John the Baptist, the witness of the yeah. works of the Father, and then you have the witness of the scriptures. So Scriptures, okay. Uh, you know, the miracles, God audibly testifying, at least at the baptism, we know on more occasions. Uh, you have John the Baptist, who was Elijah to come, who was testifying mm -hmm. of Jesus. And then uh, what the entrance is statement 39, where Jesus says, you search the scriptures for in them, and you think you have eternal life. And these are that which testify of me. And the, the irony is, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees were, quote unquote, experts in Bible trivia and stuff. Uh, but just because you have a lot of head knowledge about a subject doesn't mean you actually can see the dots being connected and, and what's going on there. Uh, so many times, uh, the truth is a lot more transparent on the surface than uh, what we think it is. Uh, to illustrate that, I remember one time reading, studying Leviticus, I'm scratching my head at the wave offering. I'm like, what on earth is a wave offering? I, to, well, what, what is that? And I called my friend. I said, hey, you've studied this. What, what's a wave offering? And I could hear his facial expressions on the phone. He says, Brendan, they literally took the offering and waved it in front of the altar. They lit up. <laughs> Sometimes the truth is just right there on the surface, and we want to make it more complicated. And that's what you see oftentimes at Pharisees and Sadducees. They want more complicated. Also, they had their own preconceived ideas that hindered them from seeing the abundance of testimony that Jesus already had in his day, that he is the Messiah and God's, you know, God's anointed. Okay, <laughs> good point. Um, Ryan, are there more witnesses in this text? Well, in John in total, yes, we haven't got to him yet, but Jesus okay. is going to say later in John 14, 15 and 16, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. He will also testify me. And then he says, and then you, the apostles will testify me bringing us to a, a sevenfold witness. That is the, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the miracles, John the Baptist, the Old Testament, uh, the apostles. So the Godhead and then those other four, seven total. So, so he cheated, Brendan. He went outside of Matthew 5, but you know, the whole John word of God. John 5 as well. John 5, man. I don't know why I'm doing that. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I, uh, I guess you're not drawing attention to your own name, right? Yeah, that's right. It's because yeah. you're so humble, yeah, yeah, it's a you humility. just can't even it's bear a to. Issue here. We, it's the humility I'm, here. Yeah. I'm the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, a couple of comments popped in real quick because um, we, I want to. We we're going to get farther into the text here, but Caleb he makes he shares the thought that like Joseph in the Old Testament with the bread maker and the cup bearer is a shadow of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. That's an interesting point, okay? Um, and then Brian sharing to the the um, chat room, the seven that testified Jesus and, and John is Father, Son, Spirit, Miracles, Moses, slash Old Testament, John, and the Apostles as well. Okay. All right, any thoughts or comments on that? So let's pause for just a minute. I think this would, this would be a good passage to look at when we're talking about why we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. All right, so we, we go to the gospel accounts of Jesus, but even within those gospel accounts, we see this idea that Jesus is saying, all right, I am true, okay? His testimony is true because I, yeah, I am who I am. But it's not just that, but it's the very actions, the miracles that were done, the statement of John and so many others that help us to say, okay, we believe Jesus is the son of God because of all the testimonies that surrounds his existence and who he was. Um, but he says there in verse 14, even if I bear witness of myself, he says, what I'm saying is true. My witness is true because he knows where he came from. He knows where he is going. 
He says, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. Now, why was that? And he, he gets into that in verse 15. But why was it that they, as he says, they did not know where he came from or where he was going? Well, John, I, I think it hit, goes back to stuff we've already hit on. Okay. Uh, they, you know, Paul would talk about in Corinthians, I believe Second Corinthians, about that they had the veil on when they read the Old Testament scriptures. They had their, and we could talk at length about what it is, but, you know, it's kind of what we already said. Their prejudice, their own preconceived ideas, their own trusting in their rule keeping, um, their outright dismissal. Uh, you even see that with uh, the early disciples. I believe it was Andrew who said in John's account, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Um, may not have been Andrew, uh, but in that exchange there, yeah. um, there is this preconceived idea. And it's not for lack of information. Going back to what we're talking about the witnesses, you know, the more and more we see the New Testament writers use of the Old Testament, I become more and more convinced that if you just study the Old Testament, ignoring the New Testament, you have enough there to see who Jesus is, what he was going to do, and enough actually for conviction to believe in him when you start reading the New Testament, if you've, if you've read and studied that. Because Jesus on the road to Emmaus, starting with the Old Testament, uh, concerning all the scriptures, explained everything concerning himself from those Old Testament scriptures. So that it's not for lack of access, it's for lack of will, it's for a lack of willingness to even consider their understandings of the Christ weren't correct. And there's a truth factory moment here. It's the same challenge we have today. You know, I just we're we're in the middle of Romans right now, and we're getting ready to go into chapter two. And Paul talks about a big issue that Jewish converts had was they sometimes think they were more superior than Gentile converts because they knew much more. And Paul says, yeah, but your knowledge really didn't help you live like you were supposed to. Um, and so the, the truth factory moment for us is, you know, we got to be careful we don't make the same mistake. Yeah, we have the knowledge. We have the access. We may be able to quote book, chapter, and verse, but we need to make sure we're actually living it. We actually are willing to be challenged by the scriptures and willing to continue to study in order to approve, make sure we're approved unto God. Um, there we That's go. Right. A rambling thoughts there. Well, that's crucial because it helps us judge with proper judgment. He says in verse 15, you judge according to the flesh. He says, I judge no one. They were not judging properly. They weren't using what you're talking about, the evidence of the Old Testament. To, to witness the very thing that was before them. And I like the reference Second Corinthians and the veil that still lies over their heart when they hear the reading of the law. That's a good point. All right, so who was it? Who said, can any good thing come out of, out of, out of um, Nazareth? Nathaniel. Nathaniel. That's it, Nathaniel. Nathaniel. I, I, I kept coming back to Bartholomew and said, it's not it. It starts with an uh, N. I think all the letters spell Andrew, except the D, are in Nathaniel, so. <laughs> It sounds like my reasoning sometimes. Yeah, the D both. and the R and the wait a second. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's like, yeah. The, le the letters come from the same yeah. alphabet. You know, it's like it's yeah. like that word Arizona. It's the same backwards or forwards. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you know. Uh, Go you ahead, know, Tom. Yeah, I was gonna say another interesting thought that as I'm reading through this, you know, it's kind of interesting when Jesus talks about if I bear witness of myself. What does that say about his humility? <laughs> and 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 and. There's an interesting point to bring up here, and I think this applies to us. You know, you talk about you shouldn't brag about yourself and stuff. But if something is true and it's driving home the point, is it wrong to draw attention to your strength? And I, I mean, I, I think that's an interesting point with Jesus. And, and I think that answers that supposed conflict in chapter five well you know i i do not bear witness of myself and and uh, <clears throat> by the way you could add a word to that implied in what he said i do not bear witness to myself alone uh i mean or only and and that's the point that he's making there and he gives all these multiple witnesses but you know what if something is true and it's driving home the point are you being arrogant uh are you being arrogant by pointing out a truth especially if it's a truth that they need to hear and, and of course as jesus is saying this as we've already noted in this mixed audience um 
this point, it, it, it's a matter of perception depending on the attitude of the hearer of what he is saying. And I think that's true with all those types of statements as well. You know, I mean, when we look at ourselves, if we're, if we're making a point of something that we've done or something that we are, it, it's certainly not, it's not necessarily arrogance. Now it can be, and it, it is up to attitude. And I think that we need to err on the side of humility and we need to err on the side of caution before we do draw undue attention to ourselves because you know I, i've heard a lot of preachers that it kind of sounds like they are full of their, themselves you know yeah you, you, you ever you know you hear the one in the pulpit who they talk about this is what i did and this is what i did and this is what uh, and uh, you know that's a little different story than what we're dealing with here with jesus and by the way i think a, a perfect example of this i looked it up the numbers chapter 12 and verse 3 <laughs> you know where it says uh where it says uh moses was more humble uh, mm -hmm. than any than any other man on earth <laughs> who wrote that <laughs> i mean uh, it, it, it was a truth god told him to say it you know clearly as he wrote it down but i think this is an interesting observation and, and jesus uses it to provoke uh, he, he he uses it wisely uh the way that it ought to be uh, to to deal with the different groups in his audience well, and, and another thought to Tom's point there is for the Jews who had been trained by the Old Testament scriptures, who were eagerly awaiting the kingdom as Nicodemus was, they, just, they didn't really necessarily need other witnesses or testimony. Jesus alone was sufficient. They, they had seen that. Now, he provides the corroborating evidence for those who need more information. And I think you, there's a parallel today. You know, for, for people we study with that already have a belief in God and in general believe that the Bible is probably authoritative, we don't need extra corroborating evidence. We, we don't. It, that witness alone is sufficient. Uh, there are others, however, that, you know, when we bring in this other stuff, it's not so much that saying, hey, I'm not crazy here and, and saying this one thing. There are other non religious writers who are testifying to the same truth that the scriptures testify to. Uh, I think you see that with the historical personhood of Jesus. Just taking the Bible as a historical document, you have four independent sources testifying to his life. That That's amazing from a historical standpoint. But we just don't have friendly sources. We have the hostile Roman sources. We have Josephus. You, you have all these other stuff. And I, I think there's a parallel there is for the people who are prepared Jesus is sufficient. For others who are more hostile, Jesus says, it's not just me testifying. I, I have all this other stuff too. Um, and so going back to a point that I think, Tom, you made earlier, it wasn't for lack of evidence. And today it's not for lack of evidence that people don't believe. It's for lack of will. Um, it, it's they don't want to. And by the way, yeah, and, and, and th that statement that you just made, that drives the nail in everything we're talking about. You don't do it because you don't want to. There was so much evidence. Jesus presented so much evidence that he fulfilled the scriptures that they, uh, but they had already made up their mind that that's not what the scriptures were about. And and they didn't want to be changed. They did not yeah. want to be changed. And anybody that threatened their way of life and their way of teaching, well, our answer is, you know, let's kill them. Let's nail them to a cross. Yeah. Um, one one additional thought. I had uh, one commentary I read one time suggested that John five thirty one, that statement in there is made from the perspective of maybe a legal proceeding. You know, whereas this right here is more of a general statement that yes, I can testify myself, and if I do, it's true anyway. But that, that was their kind of difference between the two. Because I've heard some people try to say the two passages contradict themselves. Matthew five thirty one. I don't bear witness of myself. John 8, I do bear witness of myself, or even if I do. Um, and so that was one explanation to the possible differences between the two. Um, but verse 15, real quick, a uh, couple, another question. He says, and I may have misused this earlier. He says, you judge according to the flesh. He says, I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, etc." Does that connect back to what we'll read later in John chapter 12, where he says, I do not come to condemn the world but to save the world, but then he goes on to explain the words that he teaches, the world would be judged by those things. Or is this a little bit different? I, 
I, I, well, I'm going to say well, I think you it's at home to answer yeah. this. That's right. <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I think maybe it is a little different um, uh, okay. in the in the concept of, uh, you know, especially when Jesus will throw. I, I have to say this. Jesus's comments about judgment and John are a little confusing because sometimes he talks about, you know, all judgment is mine. And then he'll say, but I'm not going to judge anyone. And of course, what? Well, not of course, but what, what best seems to be what we're understanding is Jesus says anyone who's in me gets to pass out of judgment. You know, you, you get to walk right through the courtroom, so to speak, at the last day and you're not, you know, or you could look at Revelation 20 and say, you know, the books that are open aren't going to be the books of your deeds. It's going to be the book of life, and they're just going to look for your name in it. And if your name's in it, you don't get judged. So I think that's what Jesus is saying later. And I think here he might just be speaking more to the idea, um, you know, is uh, that that the idea of ascertaining truth might be more of what he's talking about here. Um, and I say that because when he says, my judgment is true, um, I, if I don't judge, if I do judge, my judgment is true. If I do testify of myself, which I think is what judge means here, uh, it's true. You know, I, and and I think it was said well when Tom was pointing out you, we have lots of people in the Bible, very humble people. Moses is such a good example um, that could still testify of themselves, could still say, "Look, this yeah. is um, this is who I am. This is what I've done. These are these are just facts about my identity." Um, that would be the case. So it's a good question, and uh, that's my thought. Okay, so in our private chat, Tom in all caps says John 531, not Matthew. So I've written myself a note and I'll look at it and say, why am I writing my name down? John, we're in John, not Matthew. <laughs> Sorry. All right, a good, good explanation, Brian, Brendan, Brian. So, um, so he goes on to say, yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. And that goes back to what you were talking about, Brian, there. All right. And even earlier in the, the, the witness or the testimonies and so forth, Jesus makes the point that he was sent by his Father. This comes back to what he will later say in John chapter 12 in that discussion there. Um, but he says in verse 17, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Well, who are the two? He says in verse 18, I am one who bears witness of myself. And who would be the second one? The father, you know, that's why, that's why this one commentary suggested that Matthew 531 is from legal reasons. You would need extra witnesses to test on your behalf. But in this case in point, he is a valid witness because he speaks the truth of it. And he testifies of himself and the father bear witness to him, to him as well. All right. And that's going to spark another question uh, from the Pharisees here. But any thoughts or comments before we look at that? So here's the question. Where is your father? Because, all right, where he's at right now, John 8, this is still in Jerusalem. Is that correct? The conversation taking place? So is it possible that some of these people here who said, where's your father, doesn't know that Joseph was his father? since he was from Nazareth. Impossible. Okay. So they may be asking, you know, from a very literal standpoint, where is your father? Now, those who would have known Jesus would have known the answer to that question. Possibly some people speculate Joseph had already died at this point for various reasons why they, they, they think that, but here they ask Jesus, where's your father? And he says, you know, neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you'd have also known my father also. And this touches on, I think, a few things we've already stated here. I like Brian's point. Was it Brian who said it's just, or Brendan, we don't have the will. People just don't want to hear the truth. Brian said that. Okay. All right. Any thoughts or any comments about this? Well, um, just a thought here. I, again, mm -hmm. this is some of John's gospel really emphasizes, but it, it, it's elsewhere too, that to know Jesus is to know God the Father and to and, because he is, as John puts in the prologue, he is the express representation of God in the flesh. And, you know, if you really want to know what God would say, what God would do, what how God would react in a certain situation, you got to study the life of Christ in depth. Um, you know, and that, that will alleviate and guard against so many... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Extremes in our in our understandings of 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 God. For example, you know, 
sometimes people are tempted to believe that on the more liberal end of things, um, that God is basically all love and condones everything you do and da 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 da. And yet you study the life of Christ, you see that no, Jesus condemned sin. He he dealt with abuse of power. He he really did call people into account into a higher standard of living. That being said, on the opposite end, sometimes we view God as like this very spiteful uh, tyrant in the in the skies waiting to smite you with a lightning bolt or something. And again, stay in the life of Christ. You don't find that. You find him to be very compassionate with the people who don't know better, who are in darkness, who need a guide uh, out of darkness. And so you study the life of Christ, you get a balanced view of who God is. And you really get to know the fullness of God through studying the life of Christ. And I think you're seeing that here too. It just That's an application point from this. But again, their unwillingness to connect the dots, to let the scripture speak, Jesus pointing out that says, if you had known God the Father, you would have accepted me. Because I have been sent by the Father. But because you don't accept me, it's clear that you really don't know who God is. Because you have not accepted his only his only son. Uh, and it shows again, you can't have one without the other. You either accept God of all that he is, or you don't. That's a good point. Um, one quick thought. So... It sounds like sometimes if I was at you at home sitting and, and viewing this with us, you would think, man, these guys are taking this literally one verse at a time and they're not reading ahead because verse 20 tells us right where he was at when he said all this. <laughs> um, he's in the treasury as he taught in the temple. So we, we did come, we find, did settle upon that. Um, but yeah, verse 20 tells us exactly where he was when he says this. Um, there is a thought, and I hadn't thought about this until it was just, just brought up in a private chat. Their question of Jesus, where is your father, might have been a slur or an insult, an intended insult to him. Brian, you have a thought on that? Well, I kind of do, but I'm going to be careful to say um, I'm not sure yep. that it's necessarily certain. Um, this we is know a from speculation. John Chapter 1. Yeah, we would say this is speculation factor, yeah. not truth factor. Um, there, there's, there's indications in John 1 and elsewhere that Jesus' identity has been researched. That, in other words, his adversaries, just like in John 1, where they went to John, they tried to find out who he was, that they, they've done the same thing on Jesus. This is why they can say, well, I don't think he's from Bethlehem. You know, they haven't done a good job of it. But, mm -hmm. uh, but they seem to have a good knowledge of his background. They'll say, we know who his mother is. We know who his brothers are. Um, his father's not mentioned. We usually assume he's because he's deceased at that point. We mentioned that earlier. Um, but if, if they did a lot of research, they would have noticed probably that his parents got married and he was born maybe six months later, um, which is kind of, you know, what happens when, when that kind of thing happens? Well, we think, hey, you know, uh, sounds like there was a, something here. So in John chapter 8 and verse 41, when Jesus comes back to this thing about who is your father, and they'll kind of come back and say, well, we're not born of fornication. Um I've, I've often thought that that might be a throwback at Jesus. Um, and like I said, it could be a throwback at Jesus has nothing to do with any of the research. They just could be insulting Jesus. You know, well, you know, we're not, but it does seem to be kind of an insult against Jesus to, to, to suggest, well, we know who our father is. Do you know who your father is? Um, with Jesus's comments, because especially here when they say, well, who is your father? They, they know who his father is. Like they know who Joseph is. Uh, okay. they, they'll mention that elsewhere. You know, we'll, we'll see them uh, talk about this is the carpenter's son elsewhere. So this this seems to be maybe, and like I said, I'm being real careful here because uh, it doesn't really necessarily add anything other than it just kind of gives you the sense of how derogatory they can be and how, how hateful they can be to Jesus. But it also brings up a sense of uh, that, you know, they're saying, well, you know, who is your father, you know, might might even have a little more sense of do you, well do you know you know we've wondered that you know is joseph really your father not kind of language um and it might you know it might be kind of um questionable and like i said i'm just going to say that very carefully only to say that i've often wondered about this we're not born of fornication point if that it, it sounds like a jab and why would it be a jab maybe it's because they you know having looked at jesus's background might have some false false conclusions on their part. So it's just a thought. Well, well knowing, knowing how people talk and how they gossip, yeah. this could have stuck with him his whole life. Right. 
Yeah. Go ahead, Brenda. Sorry. Well, yeah. Well, I was going to say that um, sure. it would not be out of character for yeah. them, as Brian would point <clears throat> out. And and secondly, it there it be not being out of character. It's trying to undercut his own testimony. It's like, well, why would we accept the witness of a of a man who willingly accepted a wife who fornicated? You know that that you could see how that that line of logic would go. But I, I think on the reverse end, no matter how we take the, the comment there, I think you see Jesus, and there's a lot we can learn here about how when we interact with people in the world and insults get thrown or whatever, he doesn't take the bait. And he doesn't stoop down to their level. He just lets it go past him. Uh, and, you know, there there's a lot of things we learn about how Jesus talked with people and evangelized. He did not accept every invitation to every argument he was invited to. He did not respond to every insult or claim that was offered in, in opposition to him. And I think sometimes we Christians, online or in person, we have fallen for those traps too easily. We do accept every invitation we're invited to argue. We do uh, accept unfair burdens of proof when really, if you make the claim, it's not on me to disprove the claim, you have to prove the claim. And see, Jesus here, he's not taking the bait. He's going to go straight in to make keep making the points he's, he's planning to make. If you had known my father, which, if Brian's comment is true, um, kind of refutes the, the comment anyway. If you had really known my father, mm -hmm. so not Joseph, you would be accepting me. Yeah. Uh, so. <clears throat> right, yeah, and, and if, if I can build on this, uh, and, and, and this is making the observation of the opposite of what Brian said. You know, he's made the point, you got to be careful with this, because just to kind of summarize the other side of that, uh, I also see the plausibility of they know that Jesus is implying that God is his father and they're fishing, which goes to a little bit of what Brendan is saying. You know, they're 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 baiting him and it's not working. And, and that that could even go down to that. We were not born of fornication, you know, because they're, they're talking about Abraham's our father, you know, so they're talking about from a spiritual standpoint. So I mean, there is there there's both alternatives there, and and and, and I, I I think it's interesting as Brian brings, and I've thought about that before, and I, it's very much a possibility because and and like Brendan said, I certainly wouldn't put put it past them, uh, but understand this is one of those things that it could be either way, you know, uh, uh, because they're looking to accuse him. So if they can get him to say, "Oh, God is my father," with the words that they want him to say, that just gives them another nail that they can try to drive into. Well, let's just say into his hands, which will lead to his coffin. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank Brian for getting us down that rabbit trail. I think that was actually. I think it's a good discussion, though. You know, because yeah, many times it is because we're dealing with we're reading about people who are just like people today. All right, and so it's a great takeaway. Brandon, you, you made this point about we learn how we should respond, not always take the bait. You know, I've, I've known some preachers and I've been this way when I was younger and the tendency is still there. You just have to monitor it a little better to be very, um, I'll accept any challenge that comes before me, you know? And so they'll be real quick to argue, real quick to scrap about it. Um, and sometimes it's just better just not to engage. You know, depending on what the subject is, how they're coming across with the subject, with the charges and so forth, it's just better to keep control of the conversation. Yeah. All right, any other thoughts? Well, and, and to that end, we're even told in, in the preaching letters that not everything that is a biblical topic, and I use that with air quotes, sure. is mm -hmm. not edifying and worth our time. You know, yeah. Paul warns against disputes about words, endless genealogies, speculation about you know angelic mysteries and so forth mm -hmm. there are i mean there have been times where uh, rather than want to spill buckets of ink over things that actually we were told not to be arguing about uh, because it distract it detracts from the main mission and i think the main mission you see in first timothy 1 and verse 5 where paul says that the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart a sincere faith and a clear conscience um that's not a hard and fast rule, but I think if you're you're preaching and teaching, preaching and teaching needs to do one of those three one of those three things. Um, yeah. Is there a time for word studies? Is there a time to go into the genealogies listed? Yeah, sure, there is. But 
but you gotta keep the main things the main things. And I think we've, I've, I look at my own self, you know, did speech and debate all throughout high school, and that is a pretty, it's a different way of arguing, debating, and, 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 and polemics than what preaching demands. And you, I've had to watch it too, because, you know, you can win the debate and speech and debate um, pretty dirty ways that are allowed. Um, pot shots and all that kind of stuff. Mm, those techniques are not what builds faith and, and edifies. And, you know, if our goal is to edify our brethren, we got to be really careful what debates we accept invitations to, even in the world, because more people are watching than what we think they are. And how you yeah. handle it, the thing is, how you handle interaction here may not be for this person's soul. It may be for the two or three, three tables away that are eavesdropping on the conversation. You will either confirm or deny what they already think about Christians by by how you handle situations. It's a good point. It's a good point, especially if you're at like you're in public, restaurant, whatever. Yeah. Um. Well, and there's so much there we could we could really unpack with that. Even not even in in discussions of like about studying with someone, but just in general things we might say. And we might be a little less cautious, not realizing there are other people listening. But that kind of gets into a different subject of it. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, then, of course, the latter part of verse 20 there, they don't take Jesus. It's not yet his time. Um, so. All right. What are we looking at time-wise? We've got about seven minutes, roughly. So when we get into the next section here, we're just going to go a short distance here. They've already asked him one, where is your father? Okay, that's kind of the first question within this particular section here. And then when we come down to verse 22, they're going to ask him another question in regards to um, what he's about to say. So, Brandon, if you would, let's read just a, a small, short section of this. Let's read verse 21 through verse 24 and kind of break it down a little bit, due in part to the amount of time we have left. Okay, uh, John chapter, oh, chapter 8, there we go, uh, 21 through 24. Then Jesus said again to them, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself, because he says, where I go, you cannot come? And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Okay. All right. Let's talk briefly about this section here. Um, <clears throat> so, Brendan, it sounds like what Jesus is talking about is not to be taken literally. As far as you're born men and I from heaven. It sounds like he's more talking about their mindset, isn't it? You know, of, of the way they're approaching it, the way that they are hearing or not hearing. Um, someone mentioned a while ago, um, you search the scriptures for in you, in them you think you have eternal life and they're the ones that testify of me. Well, here he says, I am going away and you will seek me and will die in your sins. First off, what type of seeking him do you think they're talking about physically? Um, probably physically. I mean, we, we see after his death, they, they post the guard and they co concoct a conspiracy to lie about the disciples had stolen the body. Um, I don't think they're anticipating death per se at this point, but he's, we're, we're getting to the point where from their perspective, Jesus is at the zenith of his power and a threat to their authority. Uh, the rabbis are jealous of him because the crowds he's drawing and you know, they're, it's getting to a point where they're going to start seeking after him to destroy him, as has already been mentioned. And Jesus is saying, you're going to do that, you're not going to be able to find me. Uh, partly because he's going to be resurrected and then ascend. And they're, they're never, they still have not found him. Uh, no matter how hard people have tried over the last 2,000 years. Uh, so. But they will die in their sin. You know, normally when people seek Jesus, it's so they could live. 
yeah. or the way things would go. They will seek him and not find him, and they will die in their sins. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too is um, they're seeking him. I, I think twenty three indicates this. They're they have too much of this earthly, worldly, fleshly mm-hmm. mindset. They have that yeah. veil still, so they're seeking him physically to destroy him. Yeah. Um, I think you even see that where he says, you you cannot go where I come. And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to commit suicide. Um, and he calls out that your, your understanding is still too worldly. Um, and that's why he says in 24, he explains to them, he says, if you don't believe that I am he, um, you're going to die in your sin. So they're seeking him physically. And Jesus said, no, you need to seek me as as the Christ, as the, as the forgiver of your sins, the, the savior of your soul. Um, and until they're willing to make that switch, um, they're going to die in their sins. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, you Brian know, or Tom, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I didn't mean to step on Brian, but yeah, you know, j- just real quick observation. L- I- I've made this point before about the life of Jesus, but you'll note that as he started his ministry, it was more gentle. But as we progress along, he becomes stronger in his challenges and in the statements that he makes. And by the way, at the same way, the Pharisees become stronger, the religious leaders become stronger in their attacks and more intense. Everything about the, what he's preparing for is becoming more and more tense. And I see a little bit of that in this text. And and that's why I, I kind of lean toward we're already probably in the last year of his preaching and teaching as it's taking place here in this particular text because he's interacted with these religious leaders over and over and over and he's pretty straightforward and pretty blunt with what he is telling these people you know i'm from above you're from beneath Uh, and and he's going to say some strong things in this chapter so uh, and with that that was just my observation and now back to you brian or on to you brian i was just going to make a quick comment that i uh I, I, I underline verse 24 a lot. That's that's a preaching verse to me because I, I say it a lot. Somebody asked me, hey, do you really think that this great person that uh, is a you know Muslim or a Jew or whatever isn't going to be saved because they don't believe in Jesus? And I just go right here. I say, well, let's look at what Jesus said. If you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And I've often said that that is a black and white, as clear as you can be about what's going to happen to people uh, if you don't believe that Jesus is he, and, and sometimes I'll take this further and say, and if you don't think Jesus is king yet, you know, you're a premillennialist, then you don't believe it's that Jesus is he. If you don't think Jesus is God in the flesh, then you don't believe Jesus is he. You know, this uh, this statement, in fact, you could even say he is added, right? You, you probably notice that in your Bibles, that it's got mm-hmm. the italics indicating that he just says, if you don't believe that I am, that could be a deity statement. Uh, if you don't believe that I am, you know, that I'm God, you're going to die in your sins. Um, sometimes people say, well, you know, can it really matter what we believe uh, that that are uh, agreeing to believe something in our mind? And, and Tom said something really important earlier. Tom said, all belief is a choice. And that's one of the most important realizations any human can make. Everything you do is a choice. You're, everything you believe is a choice. You're not, you're not compelled to believe something because a series of facts made you believe it. You chose, you make a choice. Jesus says, if you don't choose to believe that I am, that I am he, you're going to die in your sins. And like I said, that's a black and white. I underlined it. I always have it memorized. I always tell people, look, you have that question. Here's your answer. Jesus said, you don't believe I'm he, you'll die in your sins. Amen to everything Brian said. And I really like your point about how reigning as king. That That's something, especially in the United States, we have kind of truncated and, and kind of left off the gospel preaching. You know, Paul in Romans chapter 1 talks about that Jesus declared Son of God in power. He he sits at the right hand of God now, and to be Messiah is to have all rule and authority. So you can't just believe that he was God and is God. You also got to believe that he is currently reigning, and you know that's where Philippians 2 comes in, that every knee will bow the knee to Jesus. Um, that that's the only response, the right response we can make to Jesus as King is pledging ourselves in service to Him. Um, you know, and that that's con- it's confessing everything that He is. A little bit later in our chapter, which could be ten weeks, uh, we won't take that long. We will make another connection here, where He says, "Most surely I say to you, before Abraham was, I am." 
you know, we'll we'll make that connection back up here. I think that's a very powerful point about verse 24. John, All don't right. sell yourself short. Uh, we should get to that in about six weeks. Six. <laughs> well, we made a little more headway today. We made it through verse 24. Um, I'll tell you what, let's plan to stop here, though. When we hit verse 25 next week, um, they'll say to him, who are you? And so then that kind of gets into the next question and um, a greater detailed explanation. You know, for preachers, and I think this is something I may work up, verse 21 through verse 24 would be a good section for a whole sermon. You know, because within that section in and of itself, um, you talk about the idea of seeking him but not finding him. You talk about the idea of thinking with the wrong mindset, thinking, as Paul would later say, carnally minded versus spiritually minded. Um, and then the building upon what Brian said there at the end of verse 24, if you don't believe that he is, then you'll die in your sins. I mean, there, there's a lot just within those four verses that would go a long way of being a very strong sermon about belief and obedience. Um, and Jesus and accepting him for who he is. All right. Any other thoughts? Okay. Let's plan then next Thursday to pick up with verse 25 of John. Okay. I'm going to say it again. John <laughs> chapter eight. And we'll continue forward through our study. All right. We'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for our study today. If you're watching this at a later point in time and you have any questions or comments about something we've said, we'd love to hear from you. Send them to questions. Contact us at questions at truthfactorlive.com or you can email us individually as you see on the screen there. Um, I haven't tested some of those emails in a while, but they should still work. You can still get hold of Brian if, if you're kind of grump, um, grumpy about something that he said or something like that. <laughs> All righty. All right. Lord willing, we'll see everyone back here again next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time as we continue through our study of the Gospel of John. Have a wonderful week.